Okay, we're going to continue on with the eigenvalue, eigenvector notion of things, and then you do another application. Now, when we were solving differential equations, one of the things I said we didn't need to do was go through the full diagonalization process in order to answer it. What we're doing today, we now do. Most of the time, you do need that. We just didn't for the, for the solving the system. So I want to take a problem from beginning to end because we're going to use this one later on. And I want, want you guys, again, be comfortable. I'm going to have an eigenvalue, eigenvector problem on the final, but it will only be two by two. Yeah, it's a, it's a time thing. I can ask you three by three on the quiz because you've got more than a week to do the problems. But on the exam, I want you to go light speed. So I want to diagonalize this. This is my goal. OK? I want to diagonalize this matrix. That means I want to find a P and a P inverse so that P inverse AP is a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are, in fact, the eigenvalues. And so that's one of the main things you learn in linear. So let's do this. There's nothing about this problem that will, will give us trouble, I hope. Okay. So this will give me negative 2 plus 2 lambda minus lambda plus lambda squared minus 4, which is lambda squared plus lambda minus 6. And this is the characteristic polynomial. When I put equal to zero, that's called the characteristic equation. That's, that's how they're related. And there's so many other cool things. For example, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, which I covered in my linear class, if I replace lambda with the actual matrix itself, and think of this as being not the number six, but six times the identity matrix. So a squared plus a minus six times the identity matrix will actually give you the zero matrix. It's considered one of the really important theorems in linear algebra, but it's, it's just a really cool result. I'll do that in my linear class, usually just with a two by two, because otherwise it just, all the processes take so long. So I have lambda, so what do we have? Lambda, I'll do, I'm gonna do minus two first. Minus two lambda plus three equals zero. So let's call lambda one two, and lambda two we'll call negative three, okay? Generally speaking, this should not be very taxing, very challenging. Um, do the lambdas actually have to be real, by the way? No, we did an example of that last week. I'm going to ask you real stuff, not because you can't do the other ones, but it's just really, really time consuming. All right, so let's find our eigenvectors, which means I'm solving A minus 2 times the identity multiplied by a matrix gives me the zero vector. So we just do it like this. Negative 4, 4, 1, negative 1, and then I augment it with those zeros. Now, I am going to do a row switch. And then how about 4 times the first row added to the second row? Boom. Okay? Now, the question came up, and I, I just want to address it briefly because some of you are going to have this question over the next couple of days. First of all, if I don't have a row of zeros, okay, I'm not worried about the last column, they're zeros, but if I don't have a row of zeros, that means I'm gonna have everything be zero. I'm gonna have the zero vector as my only solution. If the zero vector is your solution, that means something went wrong. There has to be a non-trivial vector. What if, you know, maybe I have, I have a zero in this position or something. What if it was such a case where when I did this, I got a column of zeros? That's unusual, but it can happen that when I'm doing the eigenvalue eigenvector problem. You now, Leo had just asked me this before class. I'm expecting most of you to ask me. You just haven't got to it yet. When you have a column of zeros, the column of zeros, that's called a free variable. It can be any real number. And it absolutely is not zero. <laughs> no, it's, it's equivalent to doing when you have two variables in three dimensions. You have a cylindrical shape, and that means that the missing variable can be any real number. That's how it becomes a three-dimensional shape. Okay, a simple example, because I want everyone to understand it's the same problem. If I said, I want you to do this in two dimensions, it's a circle of radius four. But what is it in three dimensions? Cylinder. It's a circular cylinder of radius four. Oh, but there's no Z, that's right. Z can be any real number up and down. That's how you get a cylindrical shape, is you have two variables in three dimensions. So whatever it is in two variables. I give you a parabola, 
and it's in 3D, it's a parabolic cylinder. If I give you a hyperbola and it's in 3D, it's a hyperbolic cylinder. Right? If I give you a square and it's in 3D, it's a, what would you call that? An infinite prism. <laughs> Technically, it's still a cylinder. Okay? So that's the same analogy exactly what we did in Calc 3. I don't have a column of zeros, but you can in the eigenvalue eigenvector problem. It is not possible to take a matrix that has numbers, you know, no, no zeros in a column. You can't, there are no uh, combination of operations that you can get a column of zeros. Right? You can get it down to one non-zero number, but you can't get all of them be zero if they didn't all start as zeros. But you can have an eigenvalue eigenvector problem with a column of zeros. It's unusual, and I think it comes up on... 24. Quiz 24? Has anybody done the quiz 24 yet? Did you run into that? Yeah. I did, it, did it puzzle you? Yeah, I stuck for a little bit. You probably thought you did it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay, but the column of zeros, the, the variable cannot be zero. The fact that the variable can be any real number, zero is the only number you wouldn't choose because that means the zero vector is your only logical vector. Remember, the eigenvector can't be the zero vector. So in this case, this is, this is nice. Yeah. So I'm going to have x1 and x2 both just be t. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. So any vector of the form, and then when I factor out the t, again, the, the process is always very similar. I want to avoid fractions if I can. Sometimes you have to. Remember, when you're making it into a unit vector, like if you had a symmetric matrix, you made these into unit vectors in, in linear, well, now you do have fractions. But when I'm doing this part, I really don't want fractions if I can avoid them. Is that x2 negative? No, because these are opposite signs. So that's oh, t right, minus right, t. Right, right. Yeah, that, that one works very nicely. So I will choose my first eigenvector to be 1, 1. Now, this, is, this next thing has to be automatic, folks. I'm going to call right over here. What's the next thing I need to do? Check. Got to check. The check is really simple. Where is it? Is there an eraser somewhere? Ah, Rick, can you toss me one of those? If you don't even throw it at me, you don't want to throw it to me. Throw it at him. Help me throw it. Yeah, it's okay. All right. You've got to check it. Negative 2 plus 4, 1 plus 1, and that is equal to 2 times 1, 1, and our eigenvalue was, in fact, 2, so this is the big... Ch why do I need to check it? Well, Gene just told us why we need to check it. Thank you for that, Gene. See, when he said, aren't these opposite signs, is that, a, is that the kind of mistake we might actually make often? Yeah. Yes. And it would be the wrong vector, and how would I know except that when I did this, it wouldn't have checked, and then I'd say, aha, I have an error. If you're not doing that, now you're reporting the wrong answer, and nothing else is going to work. And, and you won't be able to figure out what went wrong. So this, is to me, is automatic. Now, let's do the second one, which is, what is it? Uh, negative, negative three. three. Negative three. So I'll do it in black now. So a plus three i. <coughs> So I'm adding 3 to the main diagonal now. And when I do negative row 1 plus row 2, I get a row of zeros. Now, I can choose either variable, either x1 or x2, I can choose to be my parameter, but only one of them is a good choice. Which is the x1 or x2? Mm, x1. x1. So why are we choosing x2? Because it's not 1. Always pick the one that isn't one. Otherwise, you're guaranteed fractions. <laughs> so I want to choose x2 to be t. The next one will be negative 4t. If I picked x1 to be t, the next two would have been negative 1 fourth t. That's not incorrect, but it makes the rest of the problem a little uglier. Remember, we're going to find an inverse matrix. We're going to do all sorts of things. I really don't want to start with matrices of fractions. If I get fractions, I get fractions. But if I get to choose, I'm going to choose not fractions. So that's why this parameterization is a little more logical. So any vector of the form, negative 4t comma t. By the way, could I have called that negative t and that positive 4t? Would that have been legal? Sure. Nothing wrong with that. I generally don't do that. I just generally call one of them t, and then everything else sort of falls in line. So if I factor out the t, I have negative 4 comma 1. So I will now choose my second eigenvector to be negative 4, 1, and I will check it right now. 
So 8 plus 4, that's 12. Negative 4 plus 1, that's negative 3. And that, in fact, is negative 3 times this. And again, double check. <coughs> so I'm feeling good right now. So the next thing we do is we're now going to write our matrix P. Remember, P and P inverse, they actually have names. Way back when you did change of basis, do you remember what you called them? Oh. You called them transition yeah. matrices. They transitioned you from one basis to a different basis. So in this case, they'd be transitioning us from the standard basis to the non-standard basis. Well, what, what is my non-standard basis? The eigenvectors. The eigenvectors. So they are the transition matrix. Generally, from matrix B to matrix B prime, we multiply by the P inverse. But if I want to go from B prime back to B, then it's the P. I need both of them. And this is one of the simpler parts of the process, especially if it's a 2 by 2. I'm going to erase this. So now let's state our P matrix are the eigenvectors as rows or as columns? As columns. As columns. This is one of those things that it, in, in a linear class, there's always a little bit of confusion. When you're doing anything with vectors, and then you know, making a matrix out of your vectors. Never use the word always. Like that. Never say always. People say, oh, vectors are always this. No, they're not. No. When you're solving things and you're writing your answers linear combinations, the vectors are usually going to be columns. But when you're trying to do things like find the row space, or something, your vectors are rows. Vectors can be rows or columns, depending on which, what you're using them for. You just have to know which one it is. In this context, the vectors are columns because the way we did it before, remember, it's a column vector. Excuse me, a column matrix is the vector. But when you lay vectors as rows, there's a different intent. Whenever you're trying to find a span of something, you, your vectors are rows. I mean, it, there's not an always. So it, it's a context thing. So these guys are going to become columns. So what are they? It's 1, 1, negative 4, 1. Now, P inverse will be simple because this is only a 2 by 2. So what's my determinant? 5. 5, so it's going to be 1 fifth. Remember, swap, and then change the signs. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did this right. You guys okay with that? Or can I check? You can check. How do I check? You can multiply both of multiply them together. Multiply these together. together. Multiply them together, and what do I have to get? The identity. The identity. This is one of those areas that's a no-brainer. You always check, and people don't, and I wrote something down wrong. I, when I did my determinant, I made a mistake. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So I'm going to do a quick check. A fifth plus four fifths, that's one. Four fifths minus four fifths, that's zero. One fifth minus one fifth, that's zero. Four fifths plus one fifth, that's one. OK. Now, P inverse AP. I checked both my eigenvectors. They were correct. I stated my matrix P. I found P inverse, and I multiplied it out. It was correct. Do I physically need to multiply these three out now, or can I state the result? Here's, here's when you can state the result, because it would be impossible, literally impossible, for it not to work, because you checked all the pieces along the way. So I'll do my part. What are the other two positions? The And in what order? The same as the order of the eigenvectors. So which one is first? If I multiplied this out, I would get this. This is the diagonalization process. And I needed all these pieces of the puzzle. To solve the differential equation, I didn't need the p inverse. For what we're doing, we do need the p inverse. OK, so now I'm going to show you one of my favorite simple applications of this process. OK? And I want to remind you, this is a linear algebra thing. We say two matrices are similar, and the symbol we use is the same similar we use in geometry. The single squiggle is called similar. In geometry, two things that have the same shape but not necessarily the same size, like all circles are similar. All squares are similar. right? All 30, 60, 90 triangles are similar. But they're not all the same size. If they're the same size and shape, then they're congruent. What's the symbol for congruent? Remember? Oh, similar. Congruent means the same size and shape. That refers to the shape. 
How do you measure size? Area, perimeter, all that. Size is a numerical measurement, isn't it? So the, literally, the definition of congruent means in every numerical way they're the same, and they look exactly the same, same size and shape. That's why that's the symbol. And I'm, I'm always amazed how often I see people use the symbol for something completely unrelated. Now, in discrete math, we do use this for, in congruence classes, but we still use the word congruence, but it's a different application of congruence. But in this case, I'm saying similar matrices. This is not about same shape, but two matrices are similar if A equals P inverse BP, or I could have said B equals. It means there is a P and a P inverse out there that this is true. So clearly in the eigenvalue eigenvector case is true, but these don't have to be diagonal. We just say they're similar if this happens. And the point of that is, what if I want to raise A to a power? This is the most, one of the more powerful things. You learned this back in, before eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What if I want to raise A to some positive integer power? Now, as long as my matrices are square, I, I did not preface that. These have to be both n by n. This problem, it doesn't even make sense. Why? Because mm -hmm. these are both square. If these weren't square, this is impossible. These are both square matrices. I want to raise A to a power. That just means the matrix times itself times itself k times. Well, I know that's equal to this. And I'll just show you that this is a, one of the more beautiful proofs. I'm doing this k times. Now, matrix multiplication, we know, is not commutative, but it is associative. Associative means I can regroup. PP inverse, PP inverse, PP inverse. So this is going to become P inverse B identity, B identity, B identity, B P. And what happens when you multiply the matrix by the identity? You get the same thing, and this will become P inverse B to the K P. And that is one of the more powerful results. Again, that's a linear algebra result. You have two, I have two square matrices. I'm going to say they're similar to each other. If I raise one of them to the K power, the same P and P inverse did not get raised to powers. That's huge. Everybody got that? That's, that's absolutely astronomically huge. Why is that huge? Because before you leave today, before you leave today, I want you to tell me P to the 10th power. So in other words, I want you to take this matrix right here, and I want you to multiply it out 10 times. You excited about that? P to the 10th or A to the 10th? What did I say? Oh, thank you, thank you. A to the 10th, sorry. Heck, I could do the 20th power, I could do the 100th power. I, I want you to multiply it a whole bunch of times. Are you excited to do that? Nope. Please say yeah. no. No, you, you're not excited to do that. What? But wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, don't we have something? Well, let's call this matrix D for lack of a better name, D for diagonal. If D equals P inverse AP, then what does A equal? Multiply both sides on the P left by P, P, P and on the right by P. Wouldn't that be true? So wouldn't this be true? So wouldn't that just be Two, zero, one, one fifth, four fifths? So my fives are yucky today. One fifth, one fifth. Oh, by the way, when you raise a diagonal matrix to a power, you're just raising the diagonal entries to a power. That's that's a very basic one that you do really at the beginning of the course. So that becomes 2 to the 10th, negative 3 to the 10th, 0, 0, and then 1, 1. OK, I'm going to do that with my calculator. But then the rest of that, would you say that's pretty simple? In fact, let me go a step further. Change the 10, just call it n. For any positive integer, it wouldn't matter how big it was. In fact, I could have n approach infinity, and I can still give you the answer. Uh, will technology crap out at some point? Yeah. But the beautiful thing is it doesn't matter how big n is, it's still true. And by the way, if I said um, I'm working with t 2 to the 100th power, what would you do? Would you give me a numerical expansion, or would you just keep 2 to the 100th throughout? I think we'd all agree, because if you're going to give me a numerical expansion, what are you going to do when it's 2 to the billionth power? <laughs> or 2 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10th? No, you just leave it as that. Because it's the number. I, just, I, I don't need to expand it. So this is one of the huge things about eigenvalue, eigenvector, you know, linear transformation stuff. This is the linear algebra. 
This is not new information. Everything I just did, we're going to use now to answer the next question. So if I wanted to do this, this would be mind-numbing. This would be really simple. That was my point. And what if my eigen dies were even smaller, like 1 and negative 1 or something? Well, this becomes really simple then. Whereas multiplying it out would not have been. Now, a little review of Calc 2, because that's what I need next. How, uh, which version did I hold on? Which version did I write down? I did. I'm gonna do to the kt. E to the kt. Uh, you're used to seeing an x, but in the textbook, the author is using a, a t all the way through. Okay, so just use a t instead of an x. Mm. Okay, okay. Let's back up. Let's back up. Let's go. Let's do this one first because everyone may not remember. Right. So, the next thing, this I, I point out in Calc 2, this is probably one of the more important results. Good. And by the way, that is actually true for anything that you can put there. Oh, okay, so KT is my thing. So this would be 1 over n factorial KT to the n. But I want to rewrite that kind of weirdly enough. I want to write it this way. I'm going to write it as whoops, um, t to the n over n factorial times k to the n, which is odd because usually we put the variable here and we put the constant there. You're right. That's what we would usually do. I'm going to write it this way for, for a weird reason. Okay, I'll explain the weirdness in a moment. Is everybody okay with that statement, though, mathematically? If I expand this, what will I get? Let's just do the first few terms. Okay. Well, when n is 0, then I'd have 1 over 1, k to the 0, which would just be 1. Okay. Plus t to the first over 1 factorial, k to the first power. Plus t to the second over 2 factorial, k squared. Plus t to the third, 3 factorial, k to the third. Eventually, t to the n over n factorial, k to the n. Plus, okay. Do we all agree with that? Look at, don't look at the power series on the left. Look at the summation on the right. Huh. Well, t can be any variable, and I don't have a problem with that. k can be any constant. Does k actually have to be a, a number? Could k be a variable? Yeah. Could k be something else? How about K, I don't know, just for fun, a matrix. a matrix. What if I replace K, not to the left, just to the right? Is there anything wrong, algebraically, with this statement? A, A squared, I get for a square A. Didn't we just talk about that? I mentioned the Cayley Hamilton theorem a moment ago. If I take a square matrix and raise it, I can only raise it to positive integer exponents, obviously. But if I raise it to the second, third, fourth, that just means you're multiplying it that many times. That doesn't really present a problem. But in the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, the way we work that is when you got to the constant term, technically think of that as the matrix raised to the zeroth power. But it still has to be a matrix, so what should we call it? The identity, the identity matrix, because that's what we also did in the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So what does this become? Oh, yeah. T times K. T cubed over 3 factorial. That's just a simple variable expression. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, there's absolutely nothing wrong whoops, with raising a matrix to a power. That is not an issue at all. Uh, I called that. Yeah. Okay, stare at that for a moment. This is pretty weird. Do you agree? And by the way, what does all of this equal then? E to the AT. And this is, folks, is what we call a matrix exponential. This is just the starting point. Based on the power series for an exponential function, which we have no problem with, 
I expanded it and I rearranged the terms so the variable showed up here. And I said, K could literally be anything, including a matrix. In fact, we don't have any difficulty if K is a matrix. There's a consistency to this. It's kind of crazy, would you agree? So what if, Um, I have a space issue here. I don't need this stuff. I'm going to come back to this later. I don't need it yet. So let me give you a what if. What if my matrix A, let's just keep it really simple. Let's say it's lambda 1 and lambda 2. And I'm going to do a 2 by 2. It could be any size. It could be 10 by 10. By the way, that doesn't even make this part harder because it's diagonal, okay? If I raise A, again, to the K power, I, I put these side by side by side, we already know it's gonna be this, agreed? Yeah. That we know, that's, that's you know, low level stuff. So I wanna put that, that particular A, I wanna do the matrix exponential for it, okay? So I would like us to do this problem right here. Well, that means it's going to be the identity matrix plus T times, and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and write it out. No, I won't do that many terms. Ah, that's not good. Okay. I still have math hours. Yes? Based on what we just defined, this is what we should get. Agreed? I would really like to write my final answer, though, as a matrix, not as an infinite sum. The infinite sum might be correct, but if you were in a calculus class, does anybody want to work with this? No, you wanted to work with this, right? So can I do anything with this? Well, yeah. This is technically that. That's one, zero, zero, one, is it not? So can I write this then as one plus lambda one t plus, or actually, I'm sorry, I'll put the t's in front. That's the way I have it written, sorry. t lambda one plus t squared over two factorial lambda one squared, and eventually t to the n over n factorial lambda one to the n forever and ever and ever. I'm a zero comma zero, and then over here I'm gonna have something really similar. Now stare at that for a moment, do you agree? I haven't done anything clever. I just said let's just take the first elements and add them up, because that's how you do matrix addition. If two matrices are the same size, then the sum is just the sum of the corresponding positions. Well, that's still a diagonal matrix, isn't it? Huh. But how am I supposed to mess with this? Or is the answer right in front of us? Right there. Um, isn't that just this with K replaced with alpha 1? Alpha one? Oh. My goosh. You just took an exponential, raised it to a matrix power, and your answer is a matrix of exponential functions. There's, no, there's nothing weird in this matrix. You with me on that? Nothing strange. I took a matrix, excuse me, an exponential, raised it to a matrix power. Whoa. Now, the matrix I used was a diagonal matrix. Of course, and that's in real life, that's all that ever exists, right? Everything in real life is a happy diagonal already, right? Whereas maybe never again the rest of your life will you start? Yeah, probably that. So we need to figure out what to do if it's not a happy diagonal to start the problem. Well, we know how to make it a diagonal if it's diagonalizable. That's where some of the textbooks kind of fudge. 
if it's not diagonalizable, I can't do this problem. That's the, the only criteria. And believe it or not, the majority of matrices, I couldn't give you a percentage because there's infinitely many, but my experience is the vast majority of square matrices are diagonalizable. It's more of an exception when it's not. Okay, I was, I was just talking before class, even the zero matrix is diagonalizable. <laughs> I mean, it's actually difficult to find one that isn't. So I've got that for that A matrix, I, I would have it somewhere. Let me write it again. It was this, then E to the AT. You don't have to prove this again. I just did this. Okay? Wow, that's that's all I had to do. So now what if A is not a diagonal matrix, but it is diagonalizable, like the one we started class with. Okay? I'm gonna walk you through that process. And by the way, this what I showed you uh, is in is in the Diffie Q book. Most of what I showed you is in the book. I, I, some of the details are left out. The, the conclusions are all there. Some of the steps are skipped a bit, so you go, how, how did they get from there to there? It was legal. They didn't, they didn't cheat anything. But they'll stop it at that and say, this can only work with a diagonal matrix to start with, which is kind of limiting because you're rarely going to start anything with a diagonal matrix. But I can create my diagonal matrix. But a moment ago, I asked you to take a square matrix that was not diagonal and raise it to a large power. And that would have been really nasty unless I had the diagonal matrix that was similar to. And that's the one I wanted to manipulate. So what if I have a matrix that's not diagonal, but I can diagonalize it because there's enough eigenvectors? That's the next thing I want to do. Um, I'm going to come back to this problem, not yet. So I'm going to show you something that you're going to like. It's very cool. Okay. So let's suppose, suppose A is not diagonal but it's diagonalizable. And by the way, what I'm showing you doesn't matter whether it's two by two or 200 by 200. It's, as long as it's square and it's diagonalizable. What, does anybody know the exact criteria for diagonalizability? It's not about eigenvalues. It's about eigenvectors. If you have an n by n matrix, you have to have n eigenvectors. You're only guaranteed one. I can give you a simple 2 by 2 that only has one eigenvector, and therefore it not be diagonalizable. Now in the textbook, they cheated and they said, well, just now do t times that thing. Problem is you only get one eigenvector, you don't get two. So there's no p, there's no p inverse, there's no, this problem can't be addressed. So let's suppose that a is not square, excuse me, a is not diagonal, but this is true. I know what to do with this guy, that's what we just did, that's easy. I need to do this guy, okay? So how would I do that? Well, isn't it true then that we just said it a moment ago? Isn't that true? D is the happy guy. A is not the happy guy. So I want to do E to the AT. Well, then won't that be E to the PDP inverse? Uh, T? Hmm. And what would that look like? Well, just like before, uh, let me erase this stuff. The next thing I'm going to do is a little bit on the messy side, but I, hopefully you can see where this is going to go. Here, this is the identity plus t a plus t squared over two squared a squared. I'm going to go. Okay, dot dot dot. That's not helpful because A is not diagonal. So it's I plus T times P D P inverse plus T squared over two factorial P D P inverse. I'll just put plus dot 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 T to the N over N factorial. I'm sorry, this is squared, sorry. And then P D P inverse to the nth and then, okay, we know this is true. Right, that, that, there's no doubt on this statement. Is this statement entirely useful at this moment? No, because A is ugly. <laughs> I don't want to raise A to a power. Hmm. But isn't this just P D squared P inverse? And isn't this one just P D to the N P inverse? <coughs> 
Matrix multiplication is not commutative, but it is distributive. So here's a follow me on this one. Sorry. I turned my sound back on during my office hours because I needed to talk to somebody. Turn it back on. <laughs> Those are the really important things. You guys know what that is, right? What is it? Something really important. That sound? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know why, but, but yeah, I, I get ESPN alerts all the time on my phone. Okay. You're going to like this. Um, no one showed me this. I just can't stand not knowing something, so I have to prove it to myself. Stare at that for a moment and tell me if that's true. Matrix multiplication is not commutative, but it is distributive. Here's the beautiful thing. Wait, 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 wait. You still have an I there. Yeah, because it's P times I times P inverse, which is back to the I again. Is this true? Yeah, because I didn't change left and right. But what's this guy in the middle? That's e to the, d. to the dt with a p in front and a p inverse. And that is the whole point of today's lecture, is that we can solve this problem. And again, I, I'm disappointed. When I look for things, I can't find this anywhere. I actually search for this. I've, I've never been able to find this anywhere. Not sure why, because to me, this is the whole point of doing this. Don't, you don't just do the one problem you can if all the numbers are just convenient. No, we'd really like to be able to do every problem. And it doesn't matter how convenient or inconvenient. I'm doing a two by two. I just want life to be a little bit simpler. Okay? You have the ability to do something larger, right? Didn't you just do a three by three on Quiz 24? Yeah, so you could have done this whole process. This takes a little longer. Okay? So let's do that problem right there. By the way, all of this that I did here was absolutely necessary so you could see the end result. I don't need you to do this. I need you to give me the end result. You, you okay with that? You're, what I'm showing you is allowing you to skip a significant amount of the algebra. Now, you still can't skip the diagonalization. So I would like for that matrix A right there, I'll rewrite it so I can see it. I want to find e to the at. E to the AT, I now know, is a 2 by 2 matrix. And it might not be a nice matrix. It might be ugly. So what do I do? Well, you already told me that P was, was it 1, 1? Help me out. 1, 1. Um, what negative 4, 1. Negative 4, 1? Yeah. And P inverse was? Fifth, negative 1, 5th. 1, 5th. Four fifths and one fifth. Oh, this was one fifth. Off. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, for lack of a better name, uh, two and two and negative three. Two and negative three. See, I really don't remember because I just make these up <laughs> on the spot. So it's going to be P e to the dt, p inverse. And notice the order of the p and the p inverse are switched because we solved the other guy. The diagonal equals p inverse a p, but a equals p diagonal p inverse. I just proved that the p and the p inverse that were up there, I just proved that they could be pulled out. You can't just do that. Could you imagine, uh, I had someone do this on my exam the other day. Well, I can just write that as 2 e to the x, right? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I, I don't think you can do that. In other words, that's not an exponential operation. You just pull it down. I showed it because of the way we define the matrix exponential. I just did this. I proved that this is valid. Okay, But you can't just say that in general for, for numbers, obviously. So this is 1, negative 4, 1, 1. What is this matrix right here? Uh, e to the 2t, 0, 0. I'm 
do I have all the plus and minuses correct? I don't want to make a mistake here. No, those are all right. right? Yeah. Okay. The answer to the question is this product. Matrix multiplication is not commutative, but it is associative, which means I can multiply in any order I want. So what probably is the most logical? First two or last two? Uh, first two. First two, because there's no fractions yet. <laughs> yeah. I'd say, save, save the last two for the fractions. It, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get the same answer. So, what's that? Dot product here. Eh, not quite dot product, but that's what you think for each row. Okay, so I got this plus this. I got this plus this. I've got this plus this, and I got this plus this. Is that, is that correct? And all of that's times this. Now, I got a bunch of fifths. Can I add them first and then apply the fifths? Because these are exponentials, this is really not going to be advantageous one way or another. But sometimes it's easier not to, your eyes focus in on all the different fractions. It's a fifth of this plus this. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So when I write that, I've got this plus four of these. So a fifth of this plus four fifths of these. Okay. Now, next position, four of these minus four of these. So four fifths of these minus four fifths of these. Uh, that's supposed to be a negative 3t. Sorry. Negative 3t. Negative 3t. Negative 3t. Now, down here. One minus one, so a fifth of each. So a fifth of these minus a fifth of these. And then finally, four of these plus one of these. So four fifths of these plus one fifth of these. We did it. We just found the matrix exponential of a matrix that was not diagonal. Was that terrible algebra? No. You're doing, basically, you're doing linear combinations of exponential functions. And your linear combinations have fractions because the vast majority of inverse matrices have fractions. Do you ever have inverses that don't have fractions? Can that ever happen? Yeah. In two cases. The only time you can have an inverse that doesn't have fractions is if the determinant is what or what? One or? Negative one. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> only this one or negative one. That's the only time you're going to have an inverse that doesn't have fractions. Assuming your matrix entries are, are integer values. If your matrix, right, remember from doing the adjoint, if you guys yes. remember doing the cofactor matrix, you can show very simply that the inverse of every matrix is 1 over the determinant times the transpose of the cofactor. Oh, so if the determinant's not plus or minus 1, I'm multiplying by a fraction. Okay. If the determinant is plus or minus 1, then I'm multiplying by a plus or minus 1. And that's, you know, that's, that's how we get the nice problem. That's the rare case, not the, not the rule. Question so far? Everybody cool with that? This is what a matrix exponential is, but you notice that this, today's lecture was almost entirely linear algebra. That's one of the reasons linear is a prereq. This is just an exceptional thing that you may or may not ever see again, because I don't have any direct application for this now, but it takes us to a different direction. I exposed you to Laplace transforms. I exposed you to. How many remember, to some degree, doing the Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization process? Yeah, I mean, it was a, you probably never went past R3. Yeah. It's, just, it's just too long. And in some cases, you can do it for a subspace. So I had two vectors in R3. I did the Gram-Schmidt process. You got really used to it. You got good at it. And then if you did Hermitian matrices and you had to make unit vectors in complex world, it gets a little bit dicey. But one of the applications of this, which is in, in the linear algebra book, it's its own section, and I skip it, I just have people look at it and they wave, is something called Fourier analysis. Some of you have heard that term. Fourier analysis is where you're doing the Gram-Schmidt process, but the Gram-Schmidt process, once you understand um, dot product 
We know what that is. And then we stand back and we give a more fancy name. It's EU you committee and in inner product. Because I can define a different inner product. Let's say I put coefficients on dot product. As long as all my coefficients are positive, it's consistent. It doesn't break any rules. But when I am allowed to do inner products, then I can do things like dot product between isomorphic things. I can do dot products between matrices. I can do dot products between functions. Science. Once I define the integral, do you guys, did you guys do any of that? It's, it's the weird stuff. That's the segue to the Fourier analysis, which is essentially doing things like unit vectors and dot product of integrals. And it creates some nasty stuff. I don't talk about it at all. Why? Because if you're going to do them, you're probably spending an entire semester on them. I would be doing them a disservice spending 15 minutes on them. I just said, yeah, they're there in the book. If you want to confuse yourself, go ahead and look at it and move on. Well, with Laplace, we spent two solid weeks on it. Did we master it? Well, no, we, we were exposed to it. So that if you're doing it again, maybe in an upper division DE class, you now have some basis. But we didn't, didn't do anything. We just exposed ourselves to it. All right? In linear algebra, you, you did a lot when you when you got to the point where you could diagonalize a matrix, and particularly if you could work with symmetric matrices and, and do the process, you know, creating the orthogonal matrices, right, where P transpose equals P inverse. It's cool stuff, but that's not the end of it. That's the beginning of it. Your upper division class will now take you much, much, much further. You got a mass exposure. So how many here are engineers? Probably. What else are you then? Physics major. Chemistry major. Physics, chemistry, math, <laughs> engineering, am I leaving anything out? Comp side here? That's something. Did you just take this because you wanted to? No, it's a requirement. For UCs. Oh, okay. That that's didn't used to be that. Okay. So therefore some of you will be taking an upper division version, but not everybody. But even the math majors don't have to do upper division, they get to choose. I would, if you enjoyed this course at all, um, San Diego State does an upper division version of this that's not way beyond this. It's only a little bit beyond this. But you get to do more stuff because now you have a little bit more background and, and you've done all your calculuses and you've done other things. It's a course that you might enjoy. See, I'm a math person. I love teaching this stuff. I don't really get that excited about integrating or doing it. It's kind of boring to me. To me, it's just arithmetic on steroids, but it's still just arithmetic. I like proving things. That's why I like discrete and linear courses. Like I like proving the existence of solutions. Finding the solution, that's what engineering is. Proving that there actually is one is what math is all about. And if you can do both, well, then you're highly valuable and probably have a job waiting for you somewhere. But this is just an exposure. That's all this is. And we're not going to go anything past this. But now you know as if you had any score matrix that was diagonalizable, you could tell me the matrix exponential. Is there a little work involved? Yeah, but most of the work will be just finding the P and the P inverse. But the P is actually pretty automatic because you found eigenvalues and eigenvectors. They kind of go hand in hand. So now, okay, I'm finding an inverse of a three by three. Okay, that, if that's the worst thing I have to do in the problem is find an inverse of a matrix, that means that there's not really gonna be any questions that are that challenging. What if it's bigger? What if it's bigger than three by three? What if it's five by five, six by six? What, what do you do at that point? Well, now you start employing technology once you know that it's diagonalizable. Right? Once you know it's diagonalizable, right? If I, if I had to find the inverse of a really large matrix, yuck, <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know? I, yes, you can use technology once you understand that there's an answer out there. You'd rather do things that you could do by hand because you probably have a lot more faith in your answer that you did it right. Plus, the checks are rather easy along the way. All right, so we are now done with everything DE. We're going to stop that.